This is a short lecture on the limit theorems for functions. So recall that we had that, uh, we'll start off with some ideas about what it means for a function to be kind of bounded in a neighborhood of a point. So recall that a sequence though, if a sequence converges, then the set of its points, right, or the sequence is bounded. And we can say something similar about functions. So if you've got a typical setup that we've been playing with, A is just some subset of the real numbers that's gonna be the domain of my function F, and C is some real number that's a cluster point of that set A, um, then we'll say that F is bounded on some neighborhood of that cluster point C if the following happens. So there exists a delta um, and some positive number M such that the uh, tallest and absolute value that your function gets is always uh, less than or equal to m for every single x in that delta neighborhood of c. So as long as the distance from x to c is less than delta, then the output is never ever, an absolute value is never ever taller than m. And the absolute value, remember, that tells us that uh, we're also just trying to say that f of x is always above than minus m in that case too. So it's bounded on both sides. Okay, so there's that. I gotta push this a few times. And let me draw you a picture too. So in this case, I'm saying if uh, this is maybe a picture of what it looks like for a function to be bounded on some neighborhood of C. So for every single X value in this little interval down here, the outputs never get above that number M. So there's lots of different answers for what that M could be. And so maybe M depends on Delta in some way, but there's not just one M that's uh, like an upper bound in my picture for the outputs in that neighborhood of C. Okay, so what do I want to do with this? I want to tell you about something similar to this fact that we had about sequences up here, where if the sequence converges, then it's bounded. Similarly, if a function converges, so if the limit as x approaches c of my function exists, then I can say that f is bounded on some neighborhood of c. So like maybe f gets really tall elsewhere, right? Or like is unbounded, right? But in some small enough window around the input c, we should be able to say that my function is bounded. Okay, so how would we do this? So let L actually be the limit. I'm assuming that it exists. And when I say that it exists, I assume it's a real number. So L is a real number. And so let's apply what's the uh, definition of this with epsilons and deltas. So for any epsilon, there should be a delta so that if the X's are close enough to C, then the outputs F of X should be within epsilon of L. Oh, well, I'm gonna apply that for the specific epsilon one, right? So when epsilon is one, I'm guaranteed to find a delta because this limit exists, uh, such that if uh, X is in my domain A and if X is within delta of C, but again, not equal to C, I don't actually care about what happens at the value C. Uh, then what happens though, again, the outputs of my function are within one of L. And so let's apply the reverse triangle inequality to this because what am I going for? I want to say that the absolute value of f of x is less than or equal to some number, and I see that I've got something to play with here. I'll use the reverse triangle inequality to split the left side into these two pieces, and uh, that's still less than one, so now we can just add that L over, or absolute value of L. So I've got that uh, the absolute value of f of x is always smaller than one plus the absolute value of L for every x in my domain, so long as, again, x is within delta of, that shouldn't be an A there, that should be a C, so change that to a C. Cool, all right, and so I think I've got a picture for you in a minute. So for all x in that delta neighborhood of C, what do I have? I should just say, I can say then that the absolute value of x is less than or equal to whatever is bigger of the one plus absolute value of L we just found or the absolute value of f of C. In case maybe C is in your domain is it okay to and is okay to plug in. So why do we need that last piece there? Let me give you a picture of a function like this where I'm saying that I should be able to find some small enough window around C so that uh, all the outputs of my function in that window, right? So here, here, and here, they never pop out of that blue window. But uh, in my picture, right, what if I have this weird function where, I mean, it's, it's got a limit here, right? The limit of this function is L. As it gets closer and closer to C, the outputs get closer and closer to L. But I see that the actual value of the function is this point way up here that's out of that window. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that I should just take, if this is a, if I've got a weird function like this, say, that's where I'll take the bigger of these two. So that's where what would be this in that case, in this picture here. So what I'm trying to say is that settles it for really any picture that you could have. And this is maybe like a worst case scenario. Okay, and so again, we need to consider both cases just in case maybe C is okay to plug in and it's got some value that actually pops out of that window there. But again, the idea of a limit is I don't care what happens at C, I care about what happens super close to C, which is around there. 
All right, so recall the sequential criterion for limits, which says that to say that a function converges to some number L as X gets close to C, that's the same thing as saying that uh, every sequence in A that converges to C, that's not just C all the time, then uh, the sequence of outputs converges to L. So these are the same two things. So to talk about the convergence of a function, it's equivalent to, to say this statement about sequences. So why is that good? Well, we had like a whole slew of videos in a chapter out of Bartle and Sherbert about uh, limit loss for sequences, and I've already proved them. So I've got a whole bunch of limit loss for sequences, such as sums, differences, products, constant multiples of convergent sequences are still convergent. And also uh, quotients of convergent sequences will converge so long as the denominator, like your sequence in the bottom and the limit of that sequence in the bottom is always non-zero. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply, if these two things are the same, and I've got all sorts of great facts about sequences, such as this here, then yes, I've got all sorts of great facts about limits of functions as well. So I've got limit loss for functions. So there's no need to actually go through some epsilon delta definition with the limit of a function because I'm going to, I'm saying I already did all the work for sequences earlier. So if A is some subset of the real numbers, F's a function with domain A, G is a function with domain A also, and C is a cluster point of that domain A, and if B is just some real number, then I get all the following fun facts. So the limit of the sum of two functions is just the sum of those two limits. The limit of the difference of two functions is just the difference of those two limits. The limit of the product of two functions is just the product of those two limits. And the limit of a constant multiple of a function is just the constant multiple times the limit. And uh, let's see, I probably should have also said, all of this is assuming that f and g, right? So maybe these two functions individually, that their limit exists. So like a uh, limit as x goes to c of f of x, that needs to be a real number. And similarly for g. And so otherwise, maybe we get some indeterminate stuff. So there's one more law, right? I've got all these good operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, constant multiple. I need one for quotients. So if I had another function h with domain a, uh, such that h is never ever zero in this domain, and also so that the limit as x approaches c, it is a real number, but it's not zero, then I got a quotient, quotient law as well, where the limit of the quotient should just be the quotient of the limits. So what am I saying? I'm saying that now we get to use these rules and stuff that you probably just went ahead and used anyway in like a calculus one class. And like, what's the justification for them? It's that we already proved the sequential criterion for limits earlier. By the way, if you notice like all these limit laws that I have for you, I'm just using F's and G's or maybe an F and an H, just two at a time. There's nothing special about just two functions at a time. So by induction, if you had N functions that were convergent, then the, the limit of the sum of those N functions should just be, again, the sum of the limit of each one. And then similarly, the limit of the product of all n functions should just be equal to the product of each of the n limits. So there's nothing special about two at a time. So let me give you some examples just using these limit laws. So the limit as x approaches one of this thing here. If I look in the top and the bottom, I've got a quotient. I wanna use limit law number five, which tells me as long as the bottom is non-zero when I plug in one, which it's not zero, right? That's fantastic. So limit law five applies. Therefore, I could just take the limit of the top and the bottom separately, which would be one plus three over one plus two. So I'm just plugging those in. And I think that it should be equal to four thirds. Let's give you another example, maybe more generally. What if you had say two polynomials, P of X and Q of X, where here the A's, A0, A1, blah, 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 are real numbers. And similarly, B0 is the constant, B1 is the coefficient on X, et cetera. Those are real numbers. Then the limit as X approaches C of P of X, so this guy here, I mean, what do you wanna do? I wanna just plug in C. And so just to justify that for you, I had some limit laws which said, well, if this is a sum of a bunch of little functions, in individual terms, right? I should be able to apply or just take the limit of each term and then add that up. And then like these constant multiples, right? I could just think about pulling those outside if you want. And so what do I get then? I can just plug in C for all the X's. So this should be A0 plus A1C. That's what this one is. Uh, plus uh, blah, 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 plus AN C to the N. And then what is this? Well, that looks an awful lot like P of X. Instead of X, you put a C in though, didn't you? Yes, you did. So the limit of P of X as X approaches C is just P of C. We're gonna see that again later on because that is also set telling us that polynomials are continuous. We'll talk about that word continuous in a later video. And then by the way, so since I introduced these two polynomials to you, Part B here will utilize them both. If I know that Q of C is not equal to zero, then I can use my quotient law for limits here. The limit of a quotient of two polynomials should just be P of C over Q of C. 
where again, C is the point that uh, X is getting close to. So let me give you another example. Limit at X approaches two of X squared minus four over X minus two. Maybe I wanna just do the limit of the top and the bottom separately, but I see that's this, that's bad when I plug in two. If I call that thing H of X just for convenience, H of two is zero. I can't have zero in a denominator, so I can't use that limit law number five. So maybe we're stuck. Maybe we skip this one on a test. No, we don't do that. We look at what we're taking the limit of. Let's try and simplify. And I see that I can factor the top, and I see that the X minus twos cancel out, and I should just get X plus two here. So what is this, what is this stuff saying to me here? If you think about it, what we just said is that the function in orange here, f of x is x squared minus four minus two, and g of x equals x plus two. So this is equal to this, so long as x is not equal to two. So they're the same function for all other values of x but two. And if I was to draw you a picture, well, there's the function in orange there, and like, what is this denominator doing at two? It just creates a hole there on that line. Whereas if I draw you the blue graph, it's the line with that hole filled in. So now if we think about, if I wanna look at the limit as x approaches two, I'm just worried about what y value might I get in close to as my x's get closer and closer to two from both sides, say. And I see that the whole doesn't matter. And again, this kind of emphasizes the idea and the limit definition that I don't care whether I'm defined at C or not. I don't care if the function's defined at two or not. The point is, is that the Y values still get close to four. And so what we're trying to justify here is we're trying to say the limit doesn't care about the value when X is two. So we can say that the limit as X squared minus four over X minus two as X approaches two should be the same as the limit as X approaches two of the blue graph, which I see is four. All right, so the last thing I wanna tell you about is how do uh, limits of functions, uh, do they obey certain inequalities when functions do? And yes, they do, and again, because we saw these rules for sequences earlier, so we shouldn't be too surprised. So if g of x is always taller than f of x, then the limit of g of x should be taller than the limit of f of x too, as x approaches c, some real number. And there's a picture there. So again, if c is this point right here, I'm trying to say that the limit as x approaches c for that picture, maybe I should use a different color, should be smaller than the limit as x approaches c uh, for the taller graph. So like this, should be less than this, is what it's trying to say. Um, what else do I wanna tell you about? Number two, there's a squeeze theorem for functions. So if I've got these three functions here that always satisfy these inequalities for, I'm being a little bit sloppy here, for the domain that they're defined on. And by the way, up here, like this c is still assumed to be a cluster point of this domain a, anyway. Uh, but then what else am I assuming about the squeeze theorem here? What if the limit of the two outside functions is the same number L, then what do you think the limit of the inside function has to be? And so if I was to draw you a picture, here are the outer two functions and they both have the same limit as X approaches, there should be a C right there of course, as X approaches that C, if you've got a G that's supposed to fit between those two, I mean, that has to look something like that. And what do I care about? At C, I see that it's got the same limit L. And so that is the punchline. The limit as X approaches C of G of X has to be L as well. So just to give you one last example here, just to remind you how does the squeeze theorem go, I wanna evaluate the limit as X approaches zero of X times sine of one over X, and I claim that it's equal to zero. So how would I do that? And notice like, you know, I can't use one of my one through five limit laws above because I can't plug in zero to this, right? Because that would be terrible. So what we need to do is utilize some things that we know about sine. I know that sine of z is always between negative one and one for any real number that you plug into sine. Well, one over x is a fine real number as long as x isn't zero, so I'm just gonna use that as my z. So sine of one over x should still be between minus one and one as long as x is non-zero. Uh, so then what am I gonna do? I'm gonna apply, multiply rather, all sides of this by absolute value of x. And so since I'm multiplying each inequality by a positive number, I don't need to change the inequalities around and they all stay the same. So in that case, I'm just gonna simplify a little bit. This, I'll just put this minus sign in front. I don't really need this one on this side here. And if absolute value of x times sine of one over x is between these two, then I should be able to take the absolute value off the x there and keep the same inequality. So I've got this graph now, or not the graph, I've got this inequality now. So my function, x times sine of one over x right here, is between 
these two right here and right here. And uh, I'm gonna draw you a picture now. This is actually the picture of the function that's on the cover of Bartle and Sherbert. And so what it's saying to me is that my function, it's bounded above by y equals absolute value of x, and it's bounded below by y equals absolute value of, uh, negative absolute value of x, sorry about that. So in particular, now what I'm gonna do, why don't I take the limit as x goes to zero of both of these functions on the outside? Because I see, well, it looks an awful lot like both those limits are zero. All right, if I keep going towards zero, I get to zero. If I go to zero towards this way with my x values, my y values wanna to go to zero too. So therefore, if x sine of one over x is between these two that both converge to zero, then what's the middle have to do? Well, by the squeeze theorem, I know that the middle has to go to zero as well.